Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Hey, welcome to episode 257 of the show. This is part two of our feature with John F. Duffy. Last week, we had a real blast talking with John about uh, all kinds of things in the writing world and uh, his, in his life and what all went into this book of his, A Ballroom for Ghost Dancing. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing the sample chapter from that book, and it is a great one. You don't want to miss that. I actually don't have a lot for you at all. I really don't have anything for you this week. I had a family emergency come up over the weekend, so I've been gone. I actually just got back late last night, uh, so grabbed a couple hours of sleep, getting up to get this ready for you, and then uh, probably heading out here in another day or two again. Uh, so yeah, just staying really busy right now. Uh, I will tell everybody that at this time, I don't have an episode planned for next week, um, and with everything going on, I don't know that I'd be able to prepare one in advance anyway, but uh, rest assured, as soon as the next episode is, is available, it will go up and ready, so it shouldn't be more than a week or two. As always, I want to invite you all to uh, go check out our uh, podcast friends, Pop Goes Culture, the link in the show notes, and if you're interested in a little bit of swag for the show, you can go to our Tee Public store, also the link in the show notes there, and you can find something to to wear or to decorate with or uh, you know, even buttons with more designs coming soon. So uh, but that is pretty much going to be all I have this week. Uh, we've got uh, John getting ready to come up with his uh, chapter reading. Uh, he's going to give us a little bit of background into what is taking place in this particular chapter. and. Uh, yeah, and then you're going to hear the chapter reading after that. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, John F. Duffy with A Ballroom for Ghost Dancing. All right, this is a reading for sample chapter, and I believe it would be probably chapter four in the book. It is not, I do not demarcate them numerically, but it's still very early in the book. My two main characters... Adam and Mark have set off on this road trip, and this is the morning of day two. Uh, day one ended in a bit of drinking and uh, Adam getting a, uh, hitting it a little too hard, and now he's waking up, not feeling the best. What time is it? Quarter to ten. A thin band of light entered the room where Mark had raised the shade a few inches. Still draped in darkness, Adam rubbed his eyes and asked, What's the plan? Checkout is eleven, but we should probably get moving sooner. Mark clacked a few more keys on his laptop keyboard, then folded the screen shut. Rising and turning towards Adam, he said, After you shower up, we can find some place to grab a quick breakfast. Adam sat up against the wall. His half-open eyes stared at the mounds his feet made under the flower-print comforter. Thinking about nothing at all, as his head throbbed, he rubbed his temples, hoping it might temper the pain. How are you feeling? Mark asked. Like I got dragged by a bus? Do you remember much about last night? Everything except how we got back here. We rode an elephant. Is that why I smell so bad? That and the barf in your beard. I'm going to grab us some coffee. Do you need anything else? Aspirin? With an unwitting groan, Adam pivoted his body out from under the blankets, setting his feet on the floor. Is morphine an option? He asked. I'll see what they have. After a long, steaming shower, Adam felt his energy limping back. There was a nagging thump that refused to leave the base of his skull that he hoped would succumb to caffeine and Tylenol. Having returned with coffee, Mark more ridiculed than watched cable news while Adam shaved his neck and trimmed his beard. At a cafe, they ate eggs and bacon and didn't talk at all about the previous night's events. The glinting yellow challenger crossed the bridge spanning the Mississippi River at noon. Adam said nothing as he watched the steep, tree-covered hillsides of Winona slide on by. He was retracing his steps across the night before, 
like a man looking for a lost wallet, trying to find the exact place and time where his ability to enjoy himself had failed him. Maybe he should have registered some embarrassment for his behavior, but as he steadied his breathing and crawled about in the deep places of his gut where the churn of mortification would normally be seated, he found none. He wasn't ashamed of how he'd acted last night. He was intrigued. Like a mechanic tasked with reanimating a seized engine, he was less interested in condemning himself for his condition, and more interested in the broader question of whether or not this is just how he was now, if the valves of his heart had surrendered to rust. Want to pick the music? Mark asked. You can. Mark fished his phone out of his pocket and chose a Sunny Day real estate album. To release the tension in his neck, Adam rolled his head from side to side as track one of How It Feels to Be Something On began filling his ears. I haven't listened to this in so long, he said, forcing his eyes open wide, blinking away the haze that clouded them. I kind of forgot how good it is, he added. Sunlight and motion and music all joined in repairing Adam's mood, and track by track he felt increasingly disinterested in how he'd behaved, writing it off to a bad drunk and insisting to himself that it wouldn't happen again. Sorry about last night, he said, hoping to wash away any stain the evening may have left on the space between Mark and himself. You didn't do anything to me, Mark told him. Yes, I did. I was a horse's ass and you had to deal with it. It happens to the best of us. I should drink less, Adam said, looking straight ahead. If that's what you think, Mark replied, also to the windshield. After a long silence, Adam said, It's not like anything was going to happen with Carrie. What do you mean? You know, just that it's not like I blew some big opportunity. Adam was looking at Mark, who said nothing in response. So Adam expanded on his point. She lives in Wisconsin. You can't think about it like that, Mark insisted. You never know where you're going to meet someone really special. Yeah, but I can't date someone from another state. Why not? Adam just looked at Mark. I don't even own a car, Adam said, as if the question was preposterous. It'd be hard enough dating someone from the suburbs. All I'm saying is, keep your mind open. You never know what the universe is going to put in front of you. I'm plenty open. Yeah, we'll see. The land flattened on both sides of the road, revealing hundreds of square miles of corn, some already cut at the base of the stalk, some still stoically awaiting the harvester, ears hanging low and dry, leaves like brown paper gently shifting in the wind. For a long time they were quiet. Happy enough to smoke and drum his fingers on the steering wheel, Mark didn't say anything. Adam rode with his eyes closed beneath his sunglasses. Not asleep, but eager for the boot heel stomping at the base of his brain to finally quit. When an hour later it had... Adam saw a highway sign pointing the way in distance to Duluth, and his mind took the exit, flying hundreds of miles north in a flash, landing him backstage at a small music venue fifteen years younger. An ear-splitting squeal from the microphone and a crash grab his attention. He rushes to the edge of the stage to see concerned band members in the headlining act stepping forward, looking down to the dark floor below where their lead singer is pushing himself back to his feet gripping his face in a futile attempt to hold back the rush of blood pouring from his mouth. The crowd forms a circle around the shirtless man who begins screaming inaudibly, yelling for the house lights, which finally come up. Smeared blood painting his face like a circus clown, the singer drops to his hands and knees, yelling instructions. Fans desperate to please their idol begin crawling about on the disgusting floor in a vain search for the teeth that the singer lost when he tripped on his amplifier and fell off the stage face first. And there in the crowd is Tommy, standing tall, holding back his laughter. He looks up and finds Adam peeking out stage right, and winks at him. Adam chuckles at the memory. What? Mark asks, with an expectant smile. Remember when we were touring, with Plus Minus, and their singer fell off the stage? Mark eagerly chimed in. And four teeth exploded out of his head when he face-planted on the concrete? Adam nods. Tommy was watching the show from the floor. And that singer, what was his name? Troy Vernon, Mark instantly answered. But we called him Rising Sun because he had that tattoo of the sun around his belly button 
and he took off his shirt during every show? Adam shook his head and smiled. Well, he was a real asshole. More than once he said stupid shit like, you guys are lucky to be opening for us. Tommy couldn't stand him, so when Troy fell off the stage and smashed his face, Tommy saw the teeth scatter across the floor, and he grabbed two of them. Adam laughed a little, but that laugh only opened the door for more, and he began laughing so hard that when he tried to speak, he could only suck air. His glee was infectious, and Mark began laughing at how hard Adam was laughing. What's so funny? Mark asked. Adam had to speak between breaths. Later that night, we were all out on those big rocks on the waterfront. We were sharing a bottle and looking out at the lake. As Adam described the scene, he knew the details of his telling were already waiting in Mark's mind. A cold wind had blown over the surface of Lake Superior, chilling Tommy, Mark, and Adam as they took deliberate steps from one huge boulder to the next. Miles away, white light from the bow of a shadowy ship moved slowly along a line where oil-black water touched velvet blue sky. When they were standing on the furthest rocks where lapping water slapped against stone, they'd passed a short bottle of whiskey between them, three glowing red embers from the ends of their cigarettes signaling where each man stood in the darkness. Certainly they spoke, but the words they'd shared were lost to the imperfection of memory, and in their place only the timber of their specific voices, mixing with the static of wind and waves, remained. The last of the whiskey swallowed, Mark had retreated first, deftly hopping from rock to rock on his way back to the parking lot and their white van glowing under the moon. He wouldn't have heard the rattle of something small and hard dropped into the empty glass bottle, the threading of the plastic cap back onto the bottle's neck, the whistling it made as it spiraled through the air, or the insignificant splash it made after Tommy had thrown it as hard as he could into the largest of all the Great Lakes. I never put it together until this moment, but I think Tommy threw Troy's teeth into the lake, Adam wheezed. He tossed our whiskey bottle into the water, and I know I heard it rattle. He laughed from his belly. That is definitely something he would do, Mark chuckled. Fucking Tommy. He was the nicest guy, but if you pissed him off, look out. For a moment, they were there again, and Tommy was there too. The road before them a movie screen onto which each man could project his particular visions. Adam tried to cling to his brother, to keep him there in the car with them. Memories of Tommy were sacred, and Adam enjoyed them like bottles of wine in a bomb shelter at the end of the world. He sipped slowly, letting it flow over him, giving each moment in detail its due attention. Mark was the best person on earth to savor these stories with. He had been there. His eyes had witnessed the same Tommy from only a few degrees left or right, and his witnessing confirmed that it had all once been real, that Tommy had walked the earth, that he had been an outsized human being, and that Adam wasn't a madman chained to a ghost that never lived. But the moment passed. Their laughter melted away as the present reasserted itself, and the road was just the road again. That was John F. Duffy reading a sample chapter from his latest book, A Ballroom for Ghost Dancing. Hey, the link for the book and uh, everything about John is available in the show notes. Don't forget to also click the links for our podcast friends and, and our Tee Public store down there as well. And hit that subscribe button so that when we're back, you don't miss our next author, a new book, and a brand new sample chapter. Take care, everybody. See you soon. Thank you.